Thank you, Christy and John and Mort. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to unfortunately tell you that there, there were no correct answers to your first question, <laughs> but I'm going to um, try to clarify that as well. That's some relatively new data. So these are my disclosures. Um, feel free to read them. I wish I had more. Uh, but I won't be discussing any off-label use or, or investigational use in my presentation. So uh, you're all familiar with T-cell lymphomas, and this includes uh, lymphomas of NK cell origin. Uh, they account for only about 5 to 10 percent of all lymphomas in the developed world, and they have a very heterogeneous biology and features. Um, you know, we treat them with CHOP or CHOP-like regimens, similar to how we treated uh, large cell lymphoma in the 1990s or even before then, and, and there's just tremendous difficulty in developing novel therapies for these diseases. Uh, it seems every day there's a new subtype based on genetic or other distinctions. Uh, you know, if um, Oliver Twist and Little Orphan Annie had a baby, it would probably get T-cell lymphoma because these things are the ultimate orphans. Uh, no laugh at all. No, Mort is laughing. Good. Um, so uh, highly derivative treatment, uh, and we've had the misfortune that the only agents that have been developed and approved specifically for these diseases actually don't work very well, and they're extremely pleiotropic. So it's impossible to figure out who will respond, who won't respond, how patients become resistant. I'll get into that a little bit more. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, available clinical and um, background data only because uh, GIA Ruan will be giving more information later this afternoon, but I thought some introduction would be worthwhile. This is a, a fair classification of the T and NK cell neoplasms, and I'll be primarily talking about the nodal subtypes, uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma, NOS, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and angiomonoblastic T cell lymphoma. So patients do horribly. I think this really captures it all. This is a registry data from Sweden. You can see uh, the top line are those without positive anaplastic large cell lymphoma in which 60-plus uh, percent of patients are now being cured with uh, standard approaches. But all of the other subtypes were in the 20 percent range. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of room for improvement. Uh, prognosis uh, can be divided based on a variety of different prognostic models, but essentially you divide out a group that has a fair prognosis in the 50 percent range and then everybody else who does miserably. And the NCCN guidelines, um, so this is the opposite of one of your uh, answers for your or questions. Um, clinical trial is preferred for essentially any patient who doesn't have ALK positive anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, and that's really at induction uh, and at relapse. And so we strongly encourage you to enroll patients uh, on clinical trials uh, if they don't have ALK positive anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, we can certainly intensify regimens, and as was the experience with large cell lymphoma, we can make patients sick, but we don't have any evidence at this point that we can actually improve in outcomes by uh, giving more intensive upfront regimens. Uh, and adding targeted agents to CHOP or similar therapies up front also is not a, uh, a proven approach. There is, a, uh, I think, a pivotal study using brintuximab plus CHOP that uh, I'll mention later that, uh, that may change this paradigm, but we don't have that data yet. Uh, this is the German prospective trial of stem cell transplant in first remission, and you can see the patients who were transplanted really did quite a bit better. I would caution you that this was a, uh, a really selected population. Uh, and it's very hard to say whether a transplant is clearly indicated, but I think that it has become somewhat of a standard for transplant-eligible patients. And so um, many practicing clinicians are giving CHOP or CHOEP or similar therapies uh, and then consolidating with transplant at this point, although the data remains somewhat equivocal. Uh, in the relapse setting, this is uh, what I was referring to. These are three FDA-approved drugs for uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma, and you can see overall response rates in the 25 percent range, progression-free survival in the one-and-a-half to four-month range. So really, for, uh, for hematologic malignancies, this is just absolutely abysmal uh, and significant toxicity. And we have no ways of understanding who will or won't respond to these agents, how when patients who even do respond, when they progress, how they become resistant, and therefore to understand what would be rational combinations. <clears throat> 
So this is a fairly typical course for uh, drug development in, uh, in T-cell lymphomas. There's a high impact factor pa uh, paper published when someone identifies a potential target, in this case, the PDGF receptor, which is hit uh, very efficiently by imatinib. And then someone actually goes forward and does a clinical trial, and it doesn't work. And you publish a low impact factor paper that says uh, that that is actually not a viable strategy going forward. So this, this has not been a useful approach. Uh, how can we do better? Uh, you know, scientists really believe that we're smart enough. Uh, it still remains a hypothesis, but we're smart enough that if we understand the biology of these diseases, we can do a better job of targeting them. Uh, and so that requires model systems. And these, these have been almost completely absent in the T-cell lymphoma world. There are almost no cell lines. There are absolutely no viable transgenic models or, or applicable uh, xenograph models. And then we need drugs that can serve as a foundation with known mechanisms of action so that we can understand who will and won't re respond and how patients become resistant, how to, um, how to form combinations. And that requires a lot of collaboration because these diseases are very rare. So uh, what's the, the proof of that paradigm? Well, I think crizotinib is an excellent example. So in ALK rearranged lymphoma, if you treat with an ALK inhibitor, so in other words, you target something that's a true vulnerability in that disease, you can have really outstanding outcomes. And so we see overall response rates in the over 90% range uh, with very significant clinical benefit. And so uh, what I would argue is we need to find the vulnerabilities if they exist in the other types of T-cell lymphomas. Uh, with other approaches like immune therapy, we've also seen some advances. So this is data from Helen Heslop's group. They've really pioneered, along with Richard O'Reilly at, um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the development of EBV-specific autologous T cells. So you take T cells from patients, you grow them in the presence of B lymphoblastoid cell lines that are infected with EBV, and you develop EBV-specific T cells. If you then infuse these into patients with EBV-positive T cell lymphomas, We've really seen outstanding outcomes. So Helen published a, um, a phase two study in JCO a few years ago, 13 of 21 patients with multiply relapsed or refractory NK or other EBV positive T cell lymphomas responded, and 11 had CRs. Only one had relapsed with a median of three year follow up. So uh, there is a trial that's either open or soon opening. Maybe someone could clarify, I don't know the answer to that. Um, again, using this approach in Texas, so if you have a patient with EBV-positive T-cell lymphoma, this may be something to consider. Um, and then some of the agents you're more familiar with, like brentuximab, um, we've seen really outstanding outcomes, and I'll leave that for uh, GIA to, uh, to address. Uh, and in some settings, we even see better overall survival in patients who don't go on to autologous transplant uh, than among those who do. So what's been frustrating a little bit about this data is, um, so as I said, there's, there's very good data in relapse PTCL and also in a trial of uh, CHOP plus that uh, we're about to uh, hopefully see the data of. But, but what's been very frustrating about this is that uh, there's no clear correlation between the percentage of tumor cells that express CD30 and response to brentuximab. So that really doesn't make very much sense, right? The whole idea is CD30 is the target that this antibody uses to then deliver its payload. So there are multiple different possibilities. One is that uh, the assays we're using, like immunohistochemistry, are simply not sensitive enough to detect low levels of CD30. Another is that the payload is somehow able to cause a field effect, either by killing one cell and then killing another. Um, but it's been very frustrating. In fact, patients who have burdens as low as 2% CD30 positive have had responses to single agent brentuximab. And in these combination trials, 2% has been uh, the standard. Uh, the biology of that remains very, very uh, unresolved. And so this is the study I mentioned. Mogulizumab is an agent that's not available right now in the US, but it is in Japan. It's an anti-CC4 antibody, which is uh, mutated in a significant fraction of um, ATLL, adult T cell lymphoblastic, uh, excuse me, leukemia lymphoma, uh, which is much more common in Japan where this drug is uh, approved. And it has a single agent response rate of around 35% with a similarly poor progression-free survival. And uh, getting back to what Lou talked about, this is a uh, PI3 kinase delta gamma inhibitor, now called duvalisib, uh, 
um, and it is able to uh, inhibit both malignant B cells and T cells based on its activity against um, delta and gamma. It's been tested in a broad range of different B and T cell malignancies, and, and we got very interested in this when uh, my colleague Steve Horowitz presented at ASH uh, data from a phase two single agent trial of Duvalisa. Uh, and here we saw really impressive activity with a 53% uh, overall response rate in a relatively small number of patients with peripheral T cell lymphoma. And so we've now uh, started a uh, phase two two-arm study of duvalisib combined with either romadepsin or bortezomib that's open at Sloan Kettering, is opening at several other sites soon. And uh, in the first 10 patients who were treated in a phase one dose escalation, we've seen three complete responses, which is really quite unusual in uh, relapse refractory peripheral T cell lymphoma. Uh, again, as Lou alluded to, we don't know how much of this effect is uh, tumor cell autonomous and how much might be tumor cell non-autonomous, potentially by inhibiting uh, Tregs. Uh, and I think recent data published in Nature showing the importance of PI3K gamma in suppressing macrophage activity also suggests there may be an innate immune uh, mechanism involved in, uh, in this activity. So TCR signaling, we all know that the B-cell receptor is a key signaling pathway in B-cell lymphomas, and if we inhibit BTK, PI3K, and, and other uh, nodes within that signaling, we can really see striking activity in B-cell lymphomas. Is the same true for T-cell lymphomas? The answer is we don't know. We do know that there are very common mutations sprinkled throughout multiple factors downstream of the T-cell receptor, in some cases making it very difficult actually to drug it because the mutations are downstream of most of the targetable kinases. Um, and we know that in general, inhibiting the upstream kinases like the Sark family kinases or LCK do not seem to have much activity. Um, I just want to mention very briefly that we are starting to understand better outcomes related specifically to genetics and to highlight this data from uh, Andrew Feldman at the Mayo Clinic because I think it really nicely indicates that, that we may be moving into a more precision era in some of these T-cell lymphomas. And so this is data where he took ALK-negative anaplastic large cell lymphomas, and you can see uh, in A, comparison between ALK-positive and ALK-negative. And then he divided these into subsets based on chromosomal rearrangements, either of the DUSP22 gene, the TP53 gene, or what he called a, a triple negative, which is no ALK, no DUSP22, and no TP53. And you can see that in C. And you can see that, in fact, the DUSP22 rearranged do as well as the ALK rearranged, um, while the TP53 rearranged do absolutely abysmally with no long-term survivors. And those lacking any of the rearrangements do somewhere in between. So it may turn out that uh, this type of approach, at least for prognostication at this point, uh, may end up being useful. So we and uh, collaborators at a number of different institutions, including several people within this room, and this has now been expanded out to um, over 12 institutions, including uh, those in the Nordic group, uh, a few years ago got together and started a consortium to try to really build a translational discovery in these diseases. Um, and the idea is, can we make transgenic and xenograph models of these diseases? Can we better understand what the diseases are through sequencing and other next generation approaches? And can we then iteratively perform trials that are very biopsy dense to try to understand how patients become resistant to these therapies and how to use agents whose mechanism of action, like PI3 kinase inhibitors, we understand and we can build upon. And these are some of the major players. In the top left is Steve Horwitz, and then on the right, uh, Andy Inokoffer, Craig Thompson at the bottom, Eric Jacobson, my clinical colleague at Dana-Farber, Giorgio Ingarami, who's really led the uh, xenografting efforts and much of the work on JAK2, um, and then John at Cornell, and then John Astor at the Brigham and Women's, who leads our, our pathology core. We started with sequencing to try to understand uh, what are the mutations, and I'll mention here that, as you can see, IDH2 is uh, mutated in a significant fraction of cases of androminoblastic T cell lymphoma and also peripheral T cell lymphoma NOS that have a follicular helper T cell phenotype, which is similar to um, AITL. And so that created the possibility that IDH2 would be a, a, a therapeutic opportunity, and that was in your question. And uh, it turns out that in our experience using AG221, uh, the IDH2 inhibitor from Agios, uh, that that drug has actually performed quite poorly in IDH2 mutated angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma. What we've seen is evidence of, by PET, of some sites of disease responding. 
typically when IDH2 mutations are present, they're subclonal, which means they're not present in every tumor cell. So that already tells you that even if you're able to eliminate that clone, you're unlikely to cure the disease or potentially even have a major impact. And they're also present with heterozygous TET2 mutations. And we've now done single cell sequencing showing that the IDH2 mutation and the heterozygous TET2 mutation are present in the same cell. When you treat with the IDH2 inhibitor and then the patient progresses, if you re-biopsy, they now have homozygous TET2 mutations and no IDH2 mutation. And so what we think we're basically doing is selecting for complete loss of TET2, which can substitute for the IDH2 mutant. And so my thought is that um, IDH2 inhibitors are unlikely to be a major player going forward in, uh, in angioimmunoblastic. But again, that's one man's opinion. Uh, Jack statin inhibitors, on the other hand, I think do have significant promise, and uh, Jir Wan, who's going to speak later uh, in our group uh, as part of the score, are going to open a study of ruxolitinib, uh, the type 1, 2 inhibitor, uh, excuse me, the Jack 1, Jack 2 inhibitor in this disease. Um, uh, Julie Vos at Nebraska did do a phase 2 of ruxolitinib across all lymphomas, and actually the response rate in the T-cell lymphomas was around 50 percent. So again, a drug whose mechanism of action we understand whose mechanisms of resistance we can study and uh, who, that we can use as a foundation for combination therapy. And then we built a large number of patient-derived xenografts of these diseases, and this has been a wonderful collaboration with Giorgio at Cornell. Um, and so you can see at the bottom, in bold, all of the different types of T-cell lymphomas that we've now been able to serially passage through animals. And uh, these represent completely new models. So for almost all these diseases, there were simply no way to study um, you know, T-cell PLL, angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, and so on, uh, and now there is. And so this is just an example comparing the patient's tumor on the left to the PDX on the right. You can see very similar histology, very similar immunohistochemistry, the same T-cell receptor rearrangement, and flow showing the predicted um, population that you would expect in the, uh, the patient-derived xenograft. And we then took that tumor and we gave it to the cancer cell line factory at the Broad Institute, and they've now been able to generate a cell line that's beyond passage number 20 of angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma. We've been able to infect this with Cas9, so we can now do vulnerability screens. This just completely opens up the possibility to understand these diseases. And I think the thing that we've done that's most important is that we've made them available to the entire community. So we created something called the Public Repository of Xenografts that now has over 300 models of leukemia and lymphoma, um, and we signed a license with the Jackson Laboratories uh, for over 100 of these models, and they're going to be distributing them as well. And you can go to proxy.org if you have an interest um, and sign up, and what you get is uh, one-stop shopping. You select the models you like based on the disease, the clinical characteristics, the pathologic characteristics, all of the sequencing that we've done, um, and then you can generate this kind of data around um, different sets of models uh, and all this data has also been deposited in the genomics da uh, data commons that the NIH has organized. So I will stop there and summarize and just say we are the black sheep, but to a great extent I think that's been because there hasn't been a great opportunity to study T-cell lymphomas, and I'm hoping that with the development of all of these new models, with uh, findings that there's a real signal with some of these targeted inhibitors, that we can attract the drugs, the money, and the intellect to, uh, to make a big difference in this field going forward. So I'll stop there.